I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future material science and engineering. My name is Andrew Falkowski and I'm joined by Jared. That's right. This is the return of the long-awaited Andrew Jared special. And so you know that the topic is going to be a little out there and a little interesting. Yeah, I mean, the Jared Andrew specials are some of the most listened to episodes oh, in I mean, catalog. We've all seen the reviews on that say that they love me or that they love the specials. So we know that this is really what you guys are looking for. Jared, it's been a while since we've seen you. You've sort of just been a, a text bubble in our group chat. I, I haven't even seen you in the in person in such a long time. This is true. With the uh, sparks going off to Europe, my presence has been diminished because I don't get to sit in the fun shed anymore. It's just not the same over Zoom. But Yeah, I kind of miss just looking over and seeing Jared playing Clash of Clans while we're recording something on, you know, Catalysis or... Oh, Clash of Clans is a classic. I'm not going to stand for this. Yeah, I'm still alive. Uh, I'm still in school. I've got one month left. You're close. So close. The, the finish line is there. And then, I don't know, if, if, if anyone is looking for a nice mechanical engineer, send me a message on Instagram and hire me. Thanks. So, Andrew, what are we talking about today? Well, we're going to be talking about a movie I watched last night, Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, that's the whole episode? It's a great film. It's a good film. I, you know, at first I thought it was an action film, but I've come to understand it as a documentary of the tragic life of people living in central Australia. Yeah, Australia is pretty tough, yeah. I mean, the the first one was equally the same. It was kind of just, this is what life in Australia is like, Mm. which is terrible. Yeah, I mean, I was planning a visit, but maybe not. No, also, you gotta watch, like, I think almost every single animal there is poisonous in some capacity, so. What's crazy is that New Zealand doesn't have any poisonous animals. Like, it's venomous. Sorry. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, New Zealand doesn't have any dangerous animals. But you know New Zealand does have? Sheep. A lot of them. Yeah, too many. But what are we actually talking about today? Well, we're talking about, still based off movies, but we're gonna be talking about bulletproof materials. And, uh, I actually was the one who pitched this idea, and I pitched this because one year ago, almost like to the day, I had nothing going on, and I decided, man, I just got HBO Max and all these different things. Let me watch literally every single Batman property I can, and I'm playing the games, and I'm doing all this stuff, and and especially the Christopher Nolan ones, they kind of talk about like, oh, titanium dipped triweave is what they keep calling the armor, and then in the Batman games, there's like little infographics like oh this is liquid body armor this is this and this and I was like okay what is going on here and then it turns out they actually made a little bit of a video for the movies where they're talking about the science behind it and his gadgets and so I watched that and it kind of seemed like there was a lot of interesting science behind the different ways that bulletproof materials work and so I figured what better thing to do than to launch into a wonderful materialism podcast episode about the science of bulletproof armor yeah, I mean, armor's been around for a long time. I mean, it predates even the Roman Empire, using armor in combat to defend oneself. But as, you know, the technology of weapons has advanced, right, the need yeah. for, you know, steel plates or chain mail is not going to cut it against, uh, yeah. you know, a 9 millimeter round. And so, actually, it probably would. Well, I mean, you know, the obviously the other thing is, is the fact that steel and everything is really f- nice, but the complete lack of mobility is not ideal. Yeah, it's also very heavy, yeah. and it's it's expensive to produce in some capacity. Yeah, and so, you know, how do what does what do what do materials look like for trying to protect against high velocity projectiles? And you know, there's a variety of classes of armor that have kind of evolved today. Um, you know, 
going from things like ballistic fabrics to, to ceramic armors. Yeah. And even some, some newer stuff that's more or less just R&D. Yeah. It all kind of depends on what you're trying to defend against, right? Defending from a knife or some sort of, um, <laughs> some sort of uh, sharp object yeah. is very different than uh, defending against maybe even just a 9mm or a handgun round versus maybe a, a, a sniper round. Yeah, obviously, the e- even just ranging from the fact that there's specific stuff just for correctional officers because... They're gonna get. They have a high chance of getting stabbed, but I mean, no one's expecting a prisoner to pull a gun out. So obviously, the armor is dependent on its needs and its uses. Right, and let's you know just even like go into what we're kind of defending against here. We're looking at uh, sort of a, a ballistic impact, which is a very dynamic event that takes place within fifty to two hundred microseconds. So crazy. Yeah, really, your material needs to be able to respond uh, in that time frame and also re- maintain its rigidity uh, at that sort of strain rate, right? You're looking at a strain rate of about 10 to the 5th, uh, which is incredibly high. And that changes a lot of properties, right? We, o- we often test materials in pseudo-static environments or very slow you know, strain rates, but this is incredibly quickly. And so looking at a material that might perform well in a somewhat static loading condition is going to be very different than how it behaves in such a dynamic one. The other thing that you have to consider is actually the nature of the projectile itself because the the core of the bullet actually is what controls the penetration behavior, not necessarily the caliber. Well, I mean, yeah, and there's, there's so many different kinds of bullets between full metal jacket, there's even depleted uranium ones. I mean, there's so many different ways that you have to defend against one type of projectile that you really can't encompass everything. Yeah, and I mean, depending on how hard that is, yeah. right? If it's a soft metal bullet, then you really need to be defending against that and trying to deform that. But if yeah. it's you know a tungsten carbide core bullet, like good luck. And you know, depending on how sharp that tip is, it changes your stress concentrations as well. I mean, especially if you, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people in mo- have seen the movies where someone gets shot with, and you can see that once you get hit in the vest, that bullet like flattens. It's so weird to see and to think about that, and then also to consider the fact that even though you're wearing armor and the bullet's not penetrating you all of that force that yeah. was going to penetrate you is still hitting you wherever the bullet was going to hit you yeah that kinetic en- <laughs> that kinetic energy transfer happens regardless and in any case really like the goal behind the armor is to maximize energy absorption without compromising the integrity of the material so it's really you want a very hard brittle material in terms of stopping mm-hmm. or in terms of preventing penetration yeah but you also need something that's really tough yeah and so, well, and then also, as we kind of touched on, obviously the be- the biggest thing too is since it's body armor and it's used in like wartime, you have to be able to move with it. Yeah, you can't just cover yourself in head to toe in metal or something really hard because then you're kind of stuck. No Iron Man armor just yet. No. So, so let's start with the most mobile then, but also the the least protective, and that's ballistic fabrics. Yeah, I mean, also I suppose probably the one that most people know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these are woven yarns that are made from high tensile strength fibers. And so these are, you know, going to be things like ultra high, like carbon fibers, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, um, you know, uh, Kevlar, uh, which is the trade name, or you'll hear Xylon, which is another trade name for polyphenylene benzo bisoxazole. And in some cases, glass fibers as well. And here, what you're kind of looking for is a balance between both tensile strength, but also tensile modulus. Because think about a bullet coming in contact with some piece of cloth, right? It's going to depress and deform those fibers. Mm -hmm. And so you end up getting stress waves that are going to, you know, propagate through the fibers and fibers in both a a planar, but depending on how many layers you have, also maybe transverse way. And so what you're really looking for here is trying to create a material that's going to be stiff enough and strong enough that they're not going to to break under the, the, the tension that's applied by the bullet but also going to be able to dissipate those stress waves in an effective manner. And really, when you're looking uh, at, at designing these, the, the biggest thing that you know dissipates energy here is not only the fiber deformation, but more importantly, the fiber-fiber friction as they slide past one another. Because in order to deform properly, you're going to have to have fibers that, that, that slide and move. Yeah. And so if you can slow that down or create as many energy barriers to that movement as possible, that's really going to you know, dissipate a lot of energy and it's going to be kind of what you're looking for. And, and of course, that's an important thing too, to think about the fact that it, this isn't just a few layers of fiber. When you're creating this, you have to stack so many layers to actually get it to be effective. 
Yeah, like 20, 30. Yeah, and it does start to get, I think I think they end up being heavier than you'd expect. Obviously, it's still lighter than a lot of different armor, but it is still kind of thick and heavy in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you stack that many clothes on, you're not as mobile either. Like, yeah. what, the Christmas story when the mom puts all those clothes on the kid and he yeah. can't move his arms? Like, it's kind of like that. Like, it's still a pretty stiff piece of piece of yeah. clothing, but... I mean, and that's usually why the joints, you can never really armor joints just because of that, because it's so hard to move. Yeah, I mean, so the torso is, yeah. you know, the principle, that's where all your organs are. Yeah, that's, so... It, <laughs> those yeah. are harder to replace. <laughs> and then the grand scheme of things, you get shot in the arm versus shot in the heart. One's better than the other. Yeah. And the types of weaves that they do here are also important. Obviously, in a podcast, this is hard to kind of communicate, but I've, we've attached some review articles in the show notes where they actually show a number of these different weaves that they use, and there's a lot of interesting modeling and design that goes into how do stress waves propagate through these uh, different materials and architectures, and how do you combine layers such that you don't have any sort of separation of layers prematurely? And I think the ballistic fabric that most people are familiar with, it's kind of the most popular one, although it's not necessarily the best anymore, is Kevlar. Jared, do you want to tell us a little about that? So I assumed, uh, obviously, that Kevlar probably just was designed for body armor or that it was some sort of idea of an armor, but actually it was created because at the time they were anticipating a gas shortage in the 60s. And I don't know if it ever hit or not, but they, so they, the big thing was that they wanted to find which we've talked about in the past, like, you know, rubber, different. They wanted to find a use, a way to make something without using gas, oil, and stuff like that. And so they decided to pursue this idea of fibers. And so they're working with some different things, and they were trying to form liquid crystals and then pull them into fibers. And they had ended up with this solution that was kind of not ideal. It was, I think the, I think the actual description is cloudy, opalescent upon being stirred, and low viscosity. So I give something they didn't like. However, the person who is credited with the discovery, Stephanie Kowalik, she went to technician and just said, can you run this through the spinneret and let's just see what happens. And when they did it, they saw that it didn't break, unlike all the other materials that they were testing and other fibers. And once there was a didn't break, they saw that they were kind of onto something there. And so they continued to pursue the idea. And by the early 70s, we have what we call Kevlar. However, they didn't know at the time what to do with it because they started with tires, and so they continued with tires. They used it in racing tires, which is kind of funny because obviously I think it's one of those things looking back on it. You have this super strong material. How would your first thought not be to stop bullets? (laughs) But I guess at the time they were really in that tire mindset. Well, it had an incredibly high tensile strength. Yeah. And so... I mean, now you know, carbon fiber materials are finding their way into all sorts of applications. Oh, yeah. Because of that, that exceptional strength. And when do I get my Kevlar tires? You know, big tire won't let you. Interestingly okay. enough, you know, the Mad Max movies were started because of a gas shortage. Really, that's what put Central Australia into this tragic situation. Pushing beyond this, right, these ballistic fabrics can you know, function as bulletproof materials, but there's always interest in improving them. Really, they do offer the most mobility, but there's a lot of work going on to try to push them even further. So this includes adding coatings to the fiber, such as rubbers that increase the friction of the fibers to to better dissipate energy. There's also interest in introducing carbon nanotubes and other sort of fullerene structures into them as well to further uh, increase their strength. Uh, I think there's some interesting work in the literature where you know, the theoretical limit in terms of if you could, you know, nicely weave carbon nanotubes into the same structure you can for Kevlar offers a material that's significantly stronger and, uh, you know, probably not all that much heavier, probably even lighter uh, than than Kevlar we have today. And so the big problem there is can you actually manufacture carbon nanotubes to the, to the length scales that you need and in the quality that you need to actually make these? And, of course, that's another thing is we keep saying the word Kevlar, but there isn't just Kevlar. There is 10, I think, versions of Kevlar, and they range all the way from aerospace and, like, brake lines and such to body armor of different kinds. And then even the body armors diverge because they make a specific kind of Kevlar that's just for correctional officers and for knife stabbing, and it has a different, like, a completely different way of forming around it so that 
it really couldn't stop any ballistics, but it does a much better job of stopping knives and other things. Yeah, like I think I mentioned earlier that we're looking for a balance between tensile strength and tensile modulus. Yeah. So if you plot those, right, there's some great figures out there in one of the uh, included review articles where they show kind of where all these materials sit. Mm -hmm. And even Kevlar isn't the best Mm -hmm. these days, right? Uh, Some of these other materials that have come about, specifically the ultra high weight, high molecular weight polyethylenes and the um, the PBOs, the phenylene benzobisoxazole. And then it's also Zylon. the whole production's kind of trademark. The, the production's kind of interesting because um, two things. The first thing is that p- when they're making it, they replaced some of the different solvents because they had some issues with it. And what they ended up doing was when they replaced these solvents and then went to patent it, it turns out that this process that they were trying to do was patented by someone else, but for making a different thing. Obviously, this is for just a synthetic fiber. It was for Tuaron. And yeah. they ended up getting a huge patent war over this. And then on top of that, it's really expensive to make because you need to use concentrated sulfuric acid to keep it completely in synthesis until you're ready to start spinning it into a fiber. So it's definitely not a cheap thing. Oh, to yeah, get. It's, it's a really nasty process to make these. Yeah. And that actually, there's a pretty big motivation to shift to the use of natural fibers, things from cellulose and plants mm-hmm. uh, as well. But I think that, you know, the, the problems are, you know, there's some nice environmental advantages to that sort of shift and not having to use those chemicals, but I don't know that the performance is, is there at this time. Um, and so, but there, there is an active research area into trying to use natural fiber composites. But, you know, one of the problems with these ballistic fabrics is that you're still going to feel any of those impacts, right? That kinetic energy transfer is still going to be there. And yeah. there isn't really anything solid there to kind of shield you or even just absorb some of that. And so a lot of times you'll see... Well, Kevlar, there's your rib. Don't forget that. Oh, yes, of course. Our bones yeah. <laughs> can absorb that. Um, you know, you'll often see for the, the composites, they'll embed it in a polymer matrix. Yeah. And the main source uh, you know, interest there is you're adding further resistance to fiber movement. You're... Mm-hmm. Uh, allowing for load transfer so it's not just a few fibers that are going to be absorbing it you can better dissipate that yeah that energy and so you'll see a lot of carbon fiber plating which is just a polymer matrix composite and that's also why i mean they, they kind of touch on this in some things obviously a lot of shootings with kevlar can lead to broken ribs and issues just because of the fact that there's nothing behind it yeah but better than the bullet going into you much better yeah, yeah it's it's gonna break anyways so what's a better way to protect yourself then Andrew well if you want to stop a bullet we need something hard and what's harder than ceramics ceramics are very much known for their having a very high hardness very high compressive strength which is kind of exactly what you're dealing with and so they make a lot of sense and so if you're going to be going to ceramics you might as well go for the ones that can a be manufactured incredibly well with as few flaws as possible and your hardest materials that you're going to be able to manufacture consistently so alumina silicon carbide boron carbide, titanium diboride, um, and then various versions of those with, with dopants. Um, and the, there's a couple configurations that you'll see with the ceramic armors. Uh, the first consists of a thin ceramic tile mounted to a ductile metal or fabric uh, behind it. And what happens here is, you know, this provides a much lighter configuration, and you have a couple of different effects that create some predictability in terms of the failure. So when a projectile makes contact... You basically have these high amplitude compressive stress pulses that are produced in the ceramic, and these will then you know travel through the material. But stress impedance between the backing material, which is going to be a different, uh, is a different material in the ceramic, basically causes those stress waves to reflect, and in the act of reflection, they transfer from compressive to tensile stresses. Now, ceramics are strongest in compression. They, you don't want to use them in a tensile situation. They, they fracture quite easily. And so what you actually get is rather than fracture occurring at the surface where the bullet has, has struck, it actually starts from the back at the interface between that the uh, bottom of the ceramic and the, mm-hmm. the next plate, and it works its way towards the area of the, uh, of the, of the bullet, of the impact. And so you actually get a uh, fracture goes that way. And so what ends up happening there is the bullet is not actually going to penetrate the armor until that crack and the fracture has has reached uh, yeah. the, the impact site. And so you get something called dwell. And dwell basically just refers to the time at which the bullet is stopped from penetrating the ceramic. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, 
because you know of how fast bullets are moving and how fast these work, typical dwell times are about four microseconds. <gasps> yeah, it's not surprising, I guess, especially when you consider how fast cracks spread through ceramic. Yeah, I mean, how as fast as they need to. I mean, yeah. think about how much force is now, <laughs> like how how uh, strong those stresses are. Yeah, and so then you'll basically get a fracturing in, in sort of a conical profile of the ceramic, and at that point, the bullet is able to penetrate. But if the impact velocity is actually below what they call the ballistic limit of the ceramic, uh, or maybe the dwell period is long enough to permit enough stress to build up that could exceed the yield strength of the projectile and deform it, you get what's called an interface defeat, where you know the bullet isn't able to actually penetrate the ceramic, or the bullet is just completely flattened. And that's kind of your goal, right? The ceramic's probably going to shatter. Yeah. Um, but ideally it's hard enough and it abrades and erodes the bullet enough that it flattens that tip because stress is force over area. Mm -hmm. And so if you can flatten that tip, that means that if it gets to that next layer, which is a metal or a polymer composite, yeah, then the stress that's going to be provided by that bullet is going to be significantly reduced and can then be dissipated by the more ductile material. Well, and especially since obviously with a plate of armor, you can take a few shots in different spots. It's fine if that single thing fails as long as you don't get shot in the same spot twice. Yeah, I mean, ideally you'd like to limit, yeah. you know, you don't want the entire thing to fracture. Yes. You'd want localized fracture. And speaking of fracture, the other thing that you have to understand about having that metal backing plate, and this is something I talked about in the science around that Batman thing that I'd never thought about before, is of course, once that ceramic fractures, that's a bullet now. Because that ceramic is basically going high speeds towards you in sharp edges. Yeah, that kind of leads us to the next configuration you'll see, right? Because if the ceramic is great at eroding the material, you might think, well, we should have a thicker ceramic as well. Yeah. Um, but because of that high you know, velocity and as well as the high stresses, you'll just get ejection of the ceramic. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go one way. It's going to go either more or less into you or, yeah. or out. And so when they have a thicker ceramic, which is trying to further erode the bullet, they'll typically actually encase it within a metal mm -hmm. so that once it does become fractured, the, the fractures don't, you know, do not leave that encasement, which serves to actually keep, you know, those are still particles that the bullet will then have to displace. Yeah. So that makes sense. And you don't have uh, particles going the wrong way. Yeah. It would not be very fun to not die from a bullet, but instead just chunks of ceramic in you. Yeah, and, and here it is, it, it is again worth kind of noting the, you know, we said that a lot of materials are measured quasi-statically earlier, and, and you know, ceramics are, are very much this case, right? You really do need to measure them at these, these high strain rates if you're going to pr predict their performance because, you know, silicon carbides and doped silicon carbides for these sorts of armors, um, doped with either boron or nitrogen, will actually outperform um, tungsten borides and, and even alumina uh, in terms of their resistance at these high strain rates, whereas, you know, tungsten boride is going to be generally a lot harder in general. So fabrics have their use. Yeah. Ceramics have their use. It makes a lot of sense then to just create composites that can kind of target the best of both worlds, where mm -hmm. you can use ceramics as typically your front plate, because it's possible that, you, you know, a bullet's not always going to hit you directly. Yeah. It might actually skim. And so if you can have a hard enough material that you can just deflect the bullet mm -hmm. or, or, you know, hard enough to kind of resist that, that's kind of what you want. But then as you get closer to the body, you really do want ductile material that's going to be able to um, absorb and be a lot of, you know, provide some toughness uh, to, to dissipate as much energy as possible to reduce any sort of kinetic impacts. Well, and also, obviously, the same thing is the fact that you, like we kind of talked about earlier with the metal, Ceramics have the same issue. You can't really wrap it around the body in an easy way, so you only get these plates that you then put into armor holding. Yeah. Yeah, so. You know, there's also some other really interesting materials here. In fact, you know, it's possible one day we might revisit this and go a little deeper on some of these, but there's some interesting material science going on in this field, uh, such as the introduction of aluminum foam as the interlayers between the ceramics and the, the metal composites. And the idea here is the foam is going to compress. Mm -hmm. It's going to densify. But in that act of densification, it has a very unique be uh, has a very unique influence on the uh, stress waves that are propagating, and it can act as sort of a funnel for where those are going to go and uh, how those are going to be controlled. And so depending on the degree of densification and the porosity, you can have some uh, pretty um, interesting effects. I mean, it does a great job of just dissipating 
yeah. stress and trying to absorb that. I think they just did a you know a study where they had plate armor with and without it, mm-hmm. and the one with it um, did not fail nearly as often. But what does the future look like? So the future has a very misleading term, which Andrew even points out in our notes here, which it was really funny because for the longest time, especially like when I first started hearing this term, I get my assumption is not at all what it is. And that's liquid body armor. And I hear that and I think there's just a bunch of bags of liquid all over someone. And I didn't really understand how that helped in any capacity. Yeah, just Tide Pods woven yeah. into a, a shirt. Yeah, so yeah, you'll hear liquid body armor thrown around quite a bit. Yes. And um, it's it's a fluid. I mean, in reality, it's actually just Kevlar that's been soaked in a fluid. Yeah. And when we say a fluid here, there's a couple different types. The The first one is a sheer thickening um, fluid. So it's all, they're both non-Newtonian fluids though. Yes. Yes. What does that mean? A non-Newtonian fluid is a fluid that doesn't follow Newton's law of viscosity, hence the name, which just basically means that the viscosity will actually change based on stress levels. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of examples, and we'll kind of run through it, but just think ketchup, honey, anything like that. I mean, I don't even know if this is a fluid. Like, I don't know if a colloid is really a fluid. At that point, like... It's close enough. That's what they call it. It behaves like a fluid, but I don't know that it is. Like, it's a it's a substance. It is a composite fluid. And I think that's also kind of getting back to the whole idea of this being liquid body armor. It really is a stretch to call it that, and so it's kind of an interesting take on the whole entire idea. So there's a couple different types of non-Newtonian fluids that'll be used in these liquid body armors. And uh, the first is a shear thickening fluid, which is a fluid that, under any sort of applied shear stress becomes more viscous, actually hardens, um, uh, especially upon severe agitation. And this happens within milliseconds of, of experiencing that. Um, the opposite of this, of course, would be like sheer thinning, so like paint, which becomes easier to apply once it's agitated. Um, so this fluid is, is actually a colloid made of particles that normally would repel one another um, due to probably static or, or, or some other sort of coating that causes them to repel one another, and thus they're able to flow quite easily. But under compression... The repelling force is overcome, and the particles are basically clumped together to form these things called hydroclusters. In this case, these particles are actually just silica particles suspended in a polyethylene glycol, and these particles are only about a few nanometers in diameter. And so, essentially, when you have an impact, right, these are going to cluster together and basically form form a solid, but normally they're going to be able to flow. And so to make this, what they actually do is they you know, dilute this fluid in ethanol, and then they, they take Kevlar and they saturate it such that the, the shear thickening fluid will then permeate the Kevlar. And then the Kevlar is able to contain this fluid, and it may be just embedded within the matrix as well. And, you know, the hardening properties are able to be preserved in this way. And this, you know, the idea here is this would allow for fewer layers of Kevlar to be necessary because now you have a, a, you know, an additional hardening capacity mm-hmm. within it. And you know, the other idea is that this responds to the actual stress. So if you're just moving around, there shouldn't be any sort of inhibitance because there's no, there isn't a strong enough shear stress. Yeah. But upon you know contact with a projectile, the issue probably is that you know a few milliseconds isn't enough, right? We said in the beginning, it, you know, a typical ballistic contact event takes 250 to 50 microseconds. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's possible you actually won't get a fast enough response, and that's in many ways a part of the development. But an alternative to this is a magnetorheological fluid. Or MRF. Which consists of an oil filled with iron particles coated in a surfactant. So similar idea uh, is basically just keep them r- repelled from one another. Uh, and these, these particles are a little bit bigger. They're about 3 to 10 microns. And when these are exposed to a magnetic field, they will align uh, to that field and then they'll stiffen the material. So in this case, you're actually just using a magnetic field to control the orientation and the the alignment and stiffening of the material. And the hardening process, from what I could see, is about 0.02 seconds, although it's possible that this has been improved. And there's a lot of work going into looking at, instead of using spherical particles, why not use geometrical shapes? Because spheres are still able to slide past one another. Mm -hmm. But a geometrical shape, you know, there's going to be more more contact and rough edges that you have to overcome. But obviously the... uh the downside of this is very clear in the sense that how do you apply a magnetic field to something 
on on certain occasions, but not always. Yeah, so the, the idea here that's been proposed is that you'd have your vest with this fluid, you know, within the Kevlar, and then you would have circuitry uh, mm-hmm. within that as well, so you could turn it off and on. But, you know, there's going to be times when you are, let's just say, okay, you're in a, a law enforcement capacity. When you are in your vehicle or at, you know, something you necess- don't necessarily need to be protected. Yeah. But if you're about to go into something dangerous, then you could, you know, flip the circuit, activate the, the magnetic fields, and then stiffen the armor when it's necessary it's all fun and games until one resistor burns out and then suddenly you can just get shot yeah it's literally just like turning off the immortality yeah love that and then also i mean i suppose the the thing that is worth mentioning is the best part about this fluid and why they're pursuing it is because of the fact that like andrew said earlier once you have this the layers are a lot less necessary you can have fewer and with fewer layers more mobility and more mobility is always ideal especially in areas like the joints and such where now if it gets hit the armor holds up better right and you know with any of these solutions it's it's likely that one isn't going to dominate right i think we mentioned at the beginning that depending on the kind of projectile that you're trying to deflect against or the kind of situation you're designing for you're going to design it differently also, I mean, it's like you kind of mentioned earlier in the ceramics, even currently, we have to take these ceramics and these Kevlars and you use them in unison because n- there's not really going to be one end all material. It's going to be a lot of different combinations for different applications to create a sort of all encompassing envelope of safety. Yeah. And the other thing you have to think about is, is price. Yeah. Right. Like we could probably design the most bulletproof armor ever. Like mm-hmm. it's perfect. But if it costs, you know, how much to outfit a single soldier and then yeah. how many do you have to actually outfit then? Or even if you are in like a law enforcement capacity, how much money do you have to spend on those? Right. Like ballistic fabrics might be the only thing that you can afford. Um, maybe not ceramics, probably not liquid body armors or carbon nanotube technology. Yeah. And so a big component of that is how do you make something that is not only, you know, mobile, but also protective and cost effective. And I think that's kind of the the challenge going forward in balancing that. But this has been a really cool episode. I think this is a really neat space. Like this would be a fun engineering space to work in. Yeah, and I also think that this would be a great time to say, if you would like us to buy some body armor and go shoot Andrew out in the open field and see what happens, just let us know in the comments. Send us some messages. Yeah, donate to my yeah. <laughs> donate to my armor fund. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna start an armor fund. We're gonna get some different levels of armor. See what happens. Well, depending on how much we get, is how much armor I get. Oh, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll keep we'll, we'll keep the same gun no matter what. See what happens. Yep. One. Yeah. Just a nine millimeter round, yeah. and then ha- donate. And if please, <laughs> you need, we gotta get at least like over a hundred bucks, or you're done for. That being said, actually, you can. For the listeners out there, go out and buy ceramic body plates, which is kind of interesting. I didn't expect it to be so like easily available to purchase online. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the fancy stuff you can't get. Oh, of course. But yeah. this is not to say you should not put this body armor on and test it on yourself. No. If you are interested in seeing its uh, properties, you can buy it, take it to the range, and put it uh, on a target. Don't, maybe just don't do it at all. Don't waste the money. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Watch a nice video of it and say, hey, that's how that works. There are, there are a lot of cool videos out there of people showing it. There's also videos of people making their own, which may or may not work. Yeah, I, I, actually, it's funny. Just before this, I, I stumbled upon a video and sent it to Andrew, which maybe we'll post. But the moral story is uh, this is really cool scientifically. Don't test this at home in any capacity. Please don't get shot and then blame it on the materials and podcast. Only for legal reasons. Yes. Okay. This episode was sponsored by Materials Today. You can visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happenings in the material science field and read some of their fantastic articles that they've published. You can also head over to elsevier.com to find out more about their journals, books, conferences, and related programs. As always, thank you for listening to this episode of the Materialism Podcast. If you have questions or feedback, please send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, which is materialism.podcast. Finally, check out our Instagram page at materialism.podcast and connect with us to let us know what new material you'd like to hear about next. 
We'd like to give a shout out to Alphabot and Colabyte for making the music for this podcast. They both make a ton of really cool synthwave music. Go check them out on Spotify and YouTube. Catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>